by Ackroyd and Harvey, Bryony Benj Abbott, Nesta Pastana, Vicky Long and Eloise Moody. It is also an artist-led research pro project that unearths and interrogates our connection with our habitats and ecosystems, both global and local. Remember the Future is part of our three-year programme called Cultural Reforesting, where we are asking how we can transform our relationship with nature. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our speakers today. So I'm just going to read out a little bit of information about them all. So first of all, Heather Ackroyd and Dan Harvey are internationally acclaimed artists known for creating multidisciplinary works that intersect art, activism, architecture, biology, ecology and history. Um, referencing memory um, and referencing memory and time, nature and culture, urban political ecologies, climate emergency and degradation of the living planet, their time-based practice reveals an intrinsic bias towards process and event. Um, they are currently um, completing their res a residency at Orleans House Gallery and have art on display, including a work called Iggy Fox, which is a grown artwork using photosynthesis. Um, in 2019, the artist co-founded Culture Declares Emergency in response to the climate and ecological emergency. Um, so Sarah Edwards is an ethnobotanist with an interdisciplinary background straddling the, straddling the life um, and social sciences. Her career has included working as a freelance consultant as, um, and as an employee of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, UCL and Oxford University, where she currently teaches ethnobiology and biological conservation. Much of Sarah's teaching is based on insights gleaned from work on collaborative um, ethnobiology projects with Aboriginal communities in Northern Australia. Um, Zena Edwards is a poet, performer and climate activist who uses song, movement and global influences as a jump off for her words. Edwards fuses Af um, traditional African instrumentation such as the kalimba and the kora a new technology to create soundtracks for her poems and stories, producing a body of work that reaches culturally and generationally diverse audiences on an international level. Zena is radical arts educator and creative director of Verse in Dialogue, an arts, culture and public engagement production house dedicated to championing the arts for positive change. Raphael Jovine is, has worked on algal photosynthesis since before his undergraduate studies. He has grown algae under Arctic pack ice and for the Oma, in, in the Omani deserts. He is the inventor of an algal growth platform to produce new food from sun, sea and wind. And this is called Susewi. Um, Raphael, please do correct me if I got that wrong later when you are speaking. Um, he actively supports the development of the Healthy New Foods, is the co-founder of Susewi and author of The Light of Light to Life, The Miracle of Photosynthesis and How It Can Save the Planet. Um, so now I'm going to switch off my camera and hand over to Heather and Dan to introduce the conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dawn. And uh, everybody's there, Dan's there, and yeah, thank you so much to Zina, Sarah and Raphael this evening, and for everybody who's joined us this evening for this conversation. Um, so it was um, an invitation um, from Andy, uh, from the Koviak, to Dan and myself, sort of at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, and he explained about this three-year programme around culture, cultural reforesting, and how we can begin to renew our relationship with nature. And of course, it really um, caught our imagination. It was very wonderful to speak with Andy about the work and explorations that he was making as well. And he described the Orleans House Gallery, which we have to say we'd never been to before. And in fact, it really was quite a surprise when we encountered it. it it's very close to the River Thames in Twickenham, near a station of St. Margaret's, which we'd never been to before. But we sort of go down this very narrow, narrow road towards the river, and then there's a tall brick wall. And at one point, there's this small wooden door. And you sort of go through this door, and it is entering into another landscape and, and another land. And really, what for us sets the Orleans House Gallery apart from other galleries we've worked in is the house is circled by woodland that has been growing um, for centuries and this really really caught our imagination and it was winter when we were first exploring it and there was one tree that stood out partly because 
of this beautiful blue-gray hue cast from its almost horizontal, horizontally held branches, an evergreen tree with great stature, but also because this tree for us really resonates in a very early point of history. This is a cedar of Lebanon tree, and we first encountered this tree historically through the writing of Robert Poe Harrison, and this is a book that I've, we've both found very inspiring, Forest the Shadow of Civilization. And he talks about poetry and literature, but he describes how forests have been the first and the last victim of civic expansion through Western civilization. And what he also described, which was an enormous kind of revelation at the time reading this, is how actually going right, right back to the beginning of history, which is when cuneiform clay tablets were first made. And it was an accountancy data system, you know, bushels of corn, goats, um, but then became something else. How these cuneiform tablets, some of which are held at the British Museum, were actually recording the first mass destruction of forest, sacred forests of cedar, and these were huge swathes of forests that went through um, Mesopotamia um, from the Euphrates, what we now know as um, Iraq, then Babylon, through into Syria towards Lebanon. And Gilgamesh commemorated his name 600 years after his death as the first civic hero because he killed the forest demon and he cut down all of these trees. And he built his sister, he, sorry, he built his um, city larger and bigger. And this is just really registered to us as something incredibly important because we've been starting to come to terms with the notion of the term ecocide, which is a term that is describing mass destruction of habitat and nature. And it just felt for us that somehow to go right back to the dawn of history and to begin to understand that this was also the arrival of the Bronze Age, it was the arrival of writing, domestication of crops, the city-state, um, the, um, the arrival of monotheistic male gods. And to some extent, I think what we're beginning to understand and this is really gonna be part of our ongoing research. This was an overthrow of cultures who really, really um, revered and recognized the sacredness of nature, of water, of air, of soil, of species, um, that humans were within the web of life and not held in any point of ascendancy. So this is part of our research, but it's also looking into recent contemporary um, plant scientists who are now really doing some very groundbreaking work into um, plant, plant consciousness, botanic consciousness, particularly scientists such as um, Monica uh, Gaglioni um, and, uh, and a few others as well, and Robin Wall Kimmerer. So just to talk briefly about ecocide, because um, in June, a really significant moment happened. And this has been a drive through a very wonderful lawyer, the late Polly Higgins, who very sadly and prematurely died in 2018. And she really committed um, her life and her passion to bringing out a point where nature could be protected legally. And she was talking about this term ecocide. And just three weeks ago, um, legal experts and lawyers from across the world actually unveiled a definition of ecocide, which is incredibly significant as the unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. This is very, very significant because this is leading its way to a law now which can be part an amendment to the crimes against peace. So acts of ecocide against, you know, against forests, against um, indigenous people can now be held as a crime against peace. So we're actually framing our conversation this evening through the words of Robin Wall Kimmerer, a mother scientist, author, a decorated professor, and a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation. And she's, I find her work really, really extraordinary. Um, I, every time I open the book or listen to her speak on podcasts, you know, I find her very, very inspirational. 
And she asks, what if we could fashion a restoration plan that grew from multiple meanings of land, land as sustainer, land as identity, land as grocery store and pharmacy, land as connection to ancestors, land as moral obligation, land as sacred, land as self. She actually reveals that she dreams of a world guided by a lens of stories rooted in the revelations of science. You know, she's a doctor, she's highly acclaimed and framed within an indigenous worldview, stories in which matter and spirit are both given voice. She describes how plants evolved on the planet first and have had a long time to figure things out. Um, they both live above and below ground and hold the earth in place. She details the attributes and ever yielding generosity that gives life on this planet and asks, what if Western scientists saw plants as their teachers rather than their subjects? What if they told that story with that lens? So we are ashamedly and actually in huge recognition of plants, regard plants as a teacher. And this is because of our work over the last 30 years with photographic photosynthesis. I'm gonna pass over to Dan and he's going to be talking about this work. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, we never tire of it. It's always a revelation for us. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, hello everyone. Um... It is that thing as plants as teachers. I think when Heather and I first met, we were both working with living material within our work. And I think just through our observations and things, it's, it's taught us so much. And that's not through reading that, for me anyway, that's very much through observation of nature. I'm gonna share my screen and just quickly go, go through some, some images of some of the work that we have uh, at the Orleans House. Um, I hope I'm gonna to manage to share this properly. Can everyone see this? So we... Yeah, it just needs to be larger, Dan. You need to go on slide view. Maybe. So are we there? Yeah. Yep. So basically Heather and I had been working with grass within my sculptural practice and within Heather's performative practice. And this was, in the 1980s, in 1989, we met and we collaborated together for the first time in 1990. But during that exhibition, we became aware of just how light sensitive chlorophyll was, which obviously is one of those no brainers in some ways, but the detail that one could get was unbelievable. So this is projecting a negative image, uh, first done at Hull Time Based Arts uh, Photo 98 exhibition. But growing the grass vertically in the dark, one gets this amazing imprint that is like equivalent to a black and white negative, but a uh, black and white image, but in tones of, of green to, to yellow. And these pieces, I mean, they're incredibly light sensitive. So we have to grow them, nurture them, and then we have to backtrack and start to dry them before we can exhibit to them. This was at the Hangar Bicocca in Milan. In Paris, we, we did a piece, uh, this is Black Owl, that we actually are showing in the Orleans House Gallery. But to try and preserve these images, if they're kept in low light, they can last for years, but expose them to strong light, the chlorophyll, it's a natural pigment, it will disappear. So we produced a, a black and white silver gelatine life-size print of the piece. And the, the blades of grass almost become like pencil lines, like, like a graphite drawing. Another piece that we have had growing there, <laughs> it's a long story, was the Satanic Formula, which is after a collaboration uh, and meeting Renil Seninaika in Sri Lanka. And the formula is just explaining what happens when we burn fossil fuels. We're burning what chlorophyll and what the amazing power of plants has managed to put away below the soil whilst producing the atmosphere that we breathe, whilst giving us life on this planet. But every time we burn it, the fossil fuels uh, are combining with the bionic, the oxygen in our atmosphere now. So this is ancient stuff, combining with the oxygen we have now. And we know it produces CO2, new CO2, but it also produces new water vapor and energy. Obviously it's the energy that we want. But what Renil says is that this is actually stealing the breath from our fu future generations. Because as CO2 levels rise, the oxygen levels are decreasing at exactly the same rate. 
hence the, his phrase, the uh, satanic formula. Uh, this piece grew very well within the Orleans House Gallery, but it was a new strain of grass that we were using. The weather turned damp, the atmosphere wasn't so dry, and we ran into problems. A, a secondary growth, the piece actually started to go moldy, uh, and we had this sort of white and brown uh, invasive other organism living within the grass. So a lot of biodiversity going on. And as always, when working with plants, you can never be certain about anything. Nature is onto its own. If you provide the right conditions, it flourishes. If you just slightly don't do it right, then things go wrong. And I think that's probably the point we're at now. <laughs> but I'll, I'll pass back to Heather to talk about Iggy. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so, so yeah, I Iggy Fox. Um, he, actually, this photograph was provided by his mother because Iggy Fox unexpectedly and um, tragically died last year of an unexpected heart condition. Yeah, he was um, a biolog uh, biologist, a scientist, a conservationist, particularly in tropical forests. Spent a lot of time out in um, South America. And um, he's a scientist who realized that if he was just dealing with data and describing what was happening on or what was happening in the world, that he was just becoming one of the scribes of the apocalypse. And he realized at that point that he needed to be an activist. So he's actually arrested, splattering red paint onto the Brazilian embassy in protest against what was happening under Jair Bolsonaro's government, which was running rampage into indigenous lands and forest and just creating a mayhem and, and dismantling, you know, laws and environmental protections and indigenous people's protection. So his mother provided us. So in a way, we sometimes talk about growing the grass as being like a vegetal resurrection. The image is happening on a molecular level. It really is in there, it's inhabiting. So in a way, these works are like apparitions. You feel you can hold them, in, but you know that in a way that it's happening almost out of sight and is happening on a molecular level. But just to talk about the embodiment principle and how we are so, we are of nature. And we're just gonna show you um, how the pigment blood heme, um, sorry, heme, which is a pigment within blood and, and chlorophyll, Actually, the architecture of the molecules is near identical. It is so close, apart from at the center of heme, you have iron, which is holding it. And at the center of um, chlorophyll, you have magnesium. But if whether or not we're eating greens or broccoli or kale, or we're eating animals that are eating the plants, we are ingesting chlorophyll. So nature courses Nature courses through our blood, chlorophyll courses, courses through our blood. And I kind of feel in a way that this is almost like primary education material that we need to keep on understanding both the miracle of chlorophyll, uh, the, the biochemical, and I use the word miracle because it's, it is still not fully understood how the chlorophyll molecule takes um, the water molecule and literally splits water. Um, Raphael can talk, no, uh, undoubtedly talk about this further as well when we have the conversation. But actually we're gonna, I would really like to sort of open up the conversation now. Um, and it is, it is that sort of, actually Zena, it's just fantastic to have you here. Um, Zena, um, our friendship has been growing over really since the sort of inception of Culture Declares Emergency, which was very much a collective, extraordinary effort launched in April, 2019. So many people were part of making it happen, bringing their wonderful talents and skills. And we met Zena for the first time, literally before entering into Take Turbine Hall, Take Turbine Hall, when she put on this huge living grass coat and entered into the hall with this horse and an entourage of activists, about 50 of us. And she held space with this extraordinary song. And anybody who was there, it was almost like a psychic space opened up through which we all fell, both in commitment and a degree of profoundness to the power of her voice. So Zina, it's just lovely to have you here. Thank you, Heather, for inviting me. Thank you. I would love to talk about, we were just chatting the other day on, on the phone and I know, and you were talking about how you feel your work is about embodiment 
Yeah. I just wondered, and I was just sort of thinking again about the embodiment of chlorophyll in nature that is within our bodies and our blood. But I was just wondering, um, yeah, I'd just love to hear you talk about that some more, actually, Zina. Yeah. Okay, I guess uh, for me, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I can't see you, but good evening. Um, as a um, poet, I spend so much of my time thinking about how I can make um, the experience of people engaging with my poetry something that's a visceral experience because that's our um, most, I think, um, it's a way to access the deepest parts of our memory is through our body. And I think that um, um, by using the five and you know, potentially six, six senses in my work, being very descriptive, um, engaging the sense of smell. Obviously, smell is our strongest, actually, memory um, recaller because when we are born, the first thing we come to recognize is our mother's smell. Um, uh, so uh, the smell and the tongue. The tongue as well, in terms of taste, that's the way that babies um, actually, when you see people see babies and they, they, they grab for things and put them in their mouths, it's because their eyes aren't fully developed yet to understand um, 3D. So it's by putting things in their mouth that they get a sense of the shape of things and three dimensionality and also taste. So it's our very primal senses, smell and taste is where we, and those two are very deeply, you know, they're, they're connected. You can't really smell without a sense of taste in some ways. Um, so the senses are for me, uh, uh, are really important when it comes to a poetic experience. So um, I feel that, um, when I'm doing mentoring, for example, I do encourage young writers to re-engage with the body. And a lot of the time they find that very difficult because I think we live in a society that dismembers the body, that disassociates the body, um, and it also disassociates it from, from nature. So I do speak to a lot of young people who say actually they don't have a very good relationship with nature because they don't like creepy crawlies, for example, um, or they don't really want to get dirty. They think it's dirty. Um, and they just very much live um, with technology. So we have to think about how technology actually becomes um, a, a wedge between uh, nature um, and, um, and the human body and our relationship with the human body. Um, so I would say that I really like to focus on embodiment for, for a couple of reasons. A, like I said, for uh, an enriched poetic experience, but also for, um, from a spiritual perspective as well, I think there is this invisible energy that, um, uh, you know, particularly uh, our relationship with trees, I think, but nature in general, um, trees have a, a, an energy and a vibration that they emanate. And we're very much aware of them. That's why some people say, oh, forests are spooky. Um, I used to find forests a little bit spooky. And that wasn't because I watched lots of horror movies and expect you know, some crazy axe man to jump out from behind a tree. It wasn't that, I just really felt the aliveness of the space, but my relationship with it was, was quite disconnected because I was very much a city body. Um, I'm used to the jagged, harsh edges of the city and going into nature and experiencing something else that was very much outside of myself, but very real. Um, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't connect the two, but as I've got older, um, I've reconnected with nature. Um, I found it very useful to just like go out in nature and, and stand around trees with my bare feet, feel the roots underneath, get earthed, get grounded. Um, so there's this very much a, um, a spiritual um, aspect to this as well that I think we see reflected in a lot of indigenous groups um, because they understand that, that nature is abundant, that it's constantly giving, that it is a teacher, that there should be a, 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 an ethos, that's a really weak word for what I really wanna say, but an ethos of reciprocity. Um, I reckon most of that, um, let's say that that's actually rooted in, in gratitude, a gratitude that, you know, that the earth is as abundant as it is. Um, and that we are constantly given healing herbs, healing vibrations um, from nature. So um, for me, I feel as though embodiment is very much about listening to the body and not living from here up, but actually dropping into the heart, dropping into the gut, uh, dropping into, even dropping into the, the like the, the intersexual organs because there's a creative force, there's a creative energy that's there. If you, if anybody in, in, in you know, 
virtual audience believes in chakra energy then you know we're talking about like the base chakra root chakra the root chakra about being rooted to the earth you know our sacral chakra that's our creative energy and those are the ones that are perhaps most closely connected to um like raw primal creativity that we see you know nature and plants doing all of the time you know it's 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 incredible to think that you know these uh, living creatures outside of ourselves um, eat light and uh, give us air to breathe. Um, for me, that is a, a kind of a phenomenon in its own right that we should really be paying attention to in, in, a, in more than just, you know, um, where we, we become the consumers, you know, the consumers, but actually um, a, a develop a relationship with. I feel like I've been talking a lot, so I'm going to stop oh, now. No, <laughs> You know, one thing that struck struck me as well, you know, when we went into the first lockdown last year, you know, the pandemic, pan, shouting, you know, inducing terror about what is happening, you know, what's happening to our wild spaces and our wild creatures, you know, and we know that the pandemic has its roots in the incursion of, you know, urban and destruction of habitat. And even though you're sort of having a lot of time on hand, I found myself incredibly distracted apart from when I left the house and could get out and be in nature and actually be in the hay meadow or in the woods. And then I felt much more stilled. Um, actually somehow maybe it was a captivity or that sort of sense you could only go out once. That actually, the, I just, yeah, I found I needed the desire to get out and with every day just leaving and just spending time in nature. And actually there was kind of six weeks of pretty phenomenal dry, hot weather, which wasn't so good for the farmers because I could see the shriveling of the, you know, of, of the crops, <laughs> you know, day by day and week by week went without any rain. But it just felt very, very important. I also want to say actually, Zina, that it was great. There was um, a, a kind of a wonderful uh, culture declares emergency. Zina curated the offer, which is a digital platform for us um, on the 17th of June. It was a, a partnership between Create, Create Spaces to Transform Dialogue, which Zina is just sort of, um, is an emerging new platform that Zina is really exploring. And um, she, she, you know, it was an incredibly thoughtful, um, reflective and provocative um, session. Um, a distillation of poetry, in-depth discussion, experimental dance on film and earth song with wonderful contributors. It was so powerful. And, and just again, so many parts of the senses were being really, really affected and turned on and sort of brought, brought, in, brought into being. Zena was also, you know, there was a very strong message here as well is about how it was called from from the roots to the front line signposts how many solutions to the ecological crisis have ancient roots in ritual ritual and embodiment and also reflect upon the malalignment of cultural technologies and ancestral wisdoms but she was also saying that we spotlight in spiritual the spiritual and mental health cultivated and nurtured in green spaces um, and the calling of creative ethos of resilience, which tenacious eco-activists of colour implementing what's moving at the speed of healing, which I just thought was incredibly, suddenly it almost those words suddenly make you step back. But Zina, would you like to talk about this? Because it again, it's this, it's, it's who has voice here? Who has agency here? Who, who, whose experience counts here, whose embodiment of what is happening with the ecological and um, climate crisis. Yeah. I, yeah, um, I mean, I think we cannot ignore the fact that we are where we are now um, in this ecological crisis um, because of not only just destructive um, uh, actions by greed and uh, greedy governments and big corporate organizations but you can't implement it without racism you, you can't it, the structure is, is it's woven through racism is woven through this infrastructure you have to dehumanize a certain group and it just turns out that where most of the minerals and the riches are coming from are from the global south which is where predominantly where black and brown po people come from uh, which means you have to for people to buy it you have to have a particular narrative that diminishes the humanity of those people. 
that's why it doesn't seem as if that way it doesn't seem as if it, it's so quite so bad you know i think it was uh, 1969 that it was only in 1969 that the actual official uh the official um uh the, the status of aboriginal people in australia native uh, indigenous people from australia was considered no longer considered to be flora and fauna which means you know they are, have a human status now this is only 1969 this is within our lifetime yeah. um which means that you can do whatever you want. If they're part of the flora and fauna, which means they can be hunted, it means they can be killed, it means they can be removed, it, can, it, means, it means they can be displaced. It doesn't matter because they're just part of the flora and fauna. Um, so this narrative of, of um, the, the lesser black and brown body um, is woven through uh, colonial structures, ca colonial capit capitalist structures, um, and and it's um, in, re, still enforced today. We have to look at how there is um, a, a re what's the word I'm looking for um, a re uh, revamping or reframing is the word I'm looking for a reframing of that narrative. Uh, what does a climate and environmental justice activist look like? A lot of the time that the work from people from marginalised groups, uh, which is very strong, very powerful work is considered sort of community work. So you don't have to quite pay so much attention. It's that thing that you do in the margins and you're, it's community work. When actually you've got people who are, 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 are um, growing their own food, who are, have education spaces around growing food, around food sovereignty, around reclaiming spaces, um, re reclaiming spaces in nature, like going into nature and saying, as a black body, as a brown body, I have every right to be walking on this piece of land also. You know, um, and I feel as though um, it's really important that people open themselves to the idea of what a climate and environmental and ecological advocate and activist looks like. Um, a lot of us are artists also. And, you know, I speak for myself as an advocate. I speak for Sen as well. She's also an artist, Serena Solanke. Um, uh, even somebody like, um, and I say even, what I actually mean is that somebody who, like um, Ian Kowal, or Ian Solomon Kowal, um, you know, we know him as a rapper, you know, rappers is that, is that that's so many, like that gangster rap, which is all about, you know, the B word and, and money and stuff like that. But actually, no, as a rapper, what he does is he raps about trees, he raps about litter, he raps about um, uh, um, connecting with the heart. Uh, and connecting with nature but people wouldn't consider that to be an activist yet he also opened May Project Gardens and May Project Gardens exists because of his mother taking up that space in their council flat garden uh, to um, as because she suffered from bipolar um, and I really really relate to this um, to this particular garden as somebody myself who has also suffered from mental health, who has a mother who suffered from mental health, who uses a green space to uh, ground, to earth, um, to, um, to literally decompress. And for May Project Gardens to come out of that, you know, when his mother passed, he continued the garden, he continued her work as a space for well-being, as a space for, like I said, for food sovereignty and as a space of it for education and reconnecting with earth. I think it's really important that people um, who also are gatekeepers, who have access to funds, who have access to, to resources, who have and resources doesn't just mean money. It means space. It means access to your roller decks. You know, it means access to, to other kinds of um, uh, ways that you can resource a, a, a marginalized uh, group um, or a marginalized um, organization and project. Um, People have to be mindful that uh, activists like myself, I want to be part of, I love my planet. I love this earth also. And I want an opportunity to fight for her too. You yeah. know, I want to be in the space also. Um, and that, that's got nothing to do with the color of my skin. It's got to do with the fact that I'm human and I love my home. <laughs> and I want to fight for it too. This is kind of simple as that really. That's, that's great. Well, we're fighting, we're fighting together. And yes. there was some beautiful, um, comments and reflections you had there. And I think Sarah, it would just be really good to say, say hello to Sarah Edwards, who actually has experience of working in Northern Australia, 
with ab ab Aboriginal First Nations people. And Sarah, we've only actually had the chance to meet on Zoom. Um, we've had a conversation, but we were actually really inspired by this book, which is Tyson Younger Porter's Sand Talk. And in fact, you've met Tyson Younger Porter, haven't you? <laughs> we've got the same book, it's great. Um, it would be, it'd be great. I think you're muted at the moment, Sarah. You need to unmute. There we go. There we go. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to say, first of all, thank you, Heather and Dan, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. And I feel very humbled to be with, with you and Zina, who just spoke so beautifully. And so much of what you said, Zina, really resonated with me as well. Um, yes, I... I knew Tyson because I was working in a community called Arakoon, which is in far north Queensland on Cape York Peninsula. And I was invited to work there by the um, Aboriginal elders, the Wiccan Cougar elders, who were very concerned that their traditional knowledge was being lost, that the younger generation didn't seem interested and engaged they weren't the majority of them um really didn't that i think there was a lot of so much marginalization that people felt almost shame at their identity and zina's talked about you know the, the racism in australia you know the fact that people were only given rights as australian citizens in recent um years um but so many of so much of this knowledge, traditional knowledge around caring for country. And I should, I wanted to start off maybe by talking a bit about country, like the Wikmunkun word, Wikmunkun is the lingua franca of the community of Arakoon. And the Wikmunkun word for country or place is ark. So it's almost like an ark, ark, you know, the ark of the world, ark. Um, an ark means it's also a bit place and time, but there's a spiritual aspect to it. Ark is your country where your spirit emanates from and it's also where your spirit returns to when you pass. So during your lifetime the traditional owners of the country, they do not consider themselves owners in the western sense, they are the custodians, the stewards, they have responsibility to care for country out of respect for their ancestors but also the future generations. So caring for country is really important and that's intrinsic to their, way of, to their way of life. Caring for country is really important. But the knowledge, the, the language, the language around the, the names of the plants and the birds and other animals, the flora and fauna, um, a lot of the younger people are forgetting it. They're not learned, they haven't been learning it. So my project was really about working with the elders to try and promote this intergenerational transmission of knowledge. I mean, the same applies to our society, in, in very much so. I mean, it, it's a phenomenon that we're seeing across the world, this disconnect from the natural world. Aboriginal people don't see themselves as being separate from nature. They are embedded and part of nature. We all are, we are part of the natural world. And that disconnect is a real issue and is probably one of the reasons behind a lot of this destruction that we're seeing. I mean, if you, re if you ex existed and um, in the way that many indigenous people exist and view the world as being part of this extended kinship network, that we are all interconnected and we are all in this sacred balance that has to be maintained by caring for country, by having a duty, a responsibility to look after the plants and animals in our environment because there is a reciprocal relationship. And Zena mentioned that as well, that, you know, about this idea of reciprocity. And that is really fundamental to many indigenous societies across the world. They have this idea of being in a reciprocal relationship. And I think one of the issues today with um, Western conservation narratives is it's that it's not based on reciprocity. It's all about um, ecosystem services. It's very unilateral. It's about extracting and exploiting the planet. It's all about, you know, valuing nature, putting a price on nature. How can you put a price on something that has no price, that is invaluable? I mean, it's 
you know, I think that's one of the issues. And another issue I want to touch upon as well related to that, um, mu much of the conservation discourse began with the, well, the, the conservation movement in North America with John Muir. I don't know if any of you are probably aware of him, who was instrumental in establishing Yosemite as a national park to protect it. But he had this idea of pristine wilderness that was devoid of human influence. And a great injustice was done to the indigenous peoples of um, Yosemite who were forcibly evicted, you know, quite violent eviction. And after about 40 years, these beautiful meadows that had first caught the eye of John were being degraded. They weren't so biodiverse. And one of these is wilderness is very much a Eurocentric construct. If you talk to Aboriginal people, they will understand that the landscape is a cultural landscape. You know, they care for it. They in Australia, they have been um, managing the land for millennia. We know that Aboriginal people have been in Australia for 50 to 60,000 years, and they've looked after, cared for country through use of fire. Now, that's something that has become very, um, um, well, salient in the, the, the world with this climate crisis that we're currently facing with these awful destructive wildfires um, as a result of the rising temperatures. But the Aboriginal people in Australia use fire as a tool to, it's been called fire stick farming, but it was basically a way of caring for country. So you burn the fire, uh, you burn um, early on in the dry season when there's a low fuel load, uh, keep the fuel load low so that when you get the wildfires, when you have the wet season and the lightning strikes, there isn't so much fuel to burn um, that will create these incredibly destructive fires that we've been seeing in recent years. And it's probably no surprise that in recent years, we've seen these terribly destructive fires in Australia and also North America. And incidentally, the First Nation, the Native American people also used fire traditionally to maintain the landscape, to traditionally manage the landscape. So one of the big issues around, um, I'm, and I'm going off on lots of tangents here, but one of the issues around um, sort of loss of biodiversity is also loss of traditional knowledge. Loss of languages is, is key as well. So um, my work is involved around sort of teaching about biocultural diversity, this inextricable link between biological diversity and cultural diversity. If you look at a global map, a map of the world, you'll see that where you have hot spots of biological diversity, you, there's a correlation with hot spots of linguistic diversity, these indigenous languages. Um, and th that's, that's probably no surprise to people like me who work with indigenous communities. Um, but one of the issues that there are, we know that there are about 7,000 languages currently spoken in the world, maybe something about, about 6,500 to 7,000 languages. And languages are disappearing in the same way that um, biodiversity is disappearing. The loss of languages and the loss of biodiversity are interlinked. So in some of the same processes that cause loss of biodiversity, sort of globalization, industrialization, et cetera, colo colonization, colonialism, um, resulting in loss of these languages. And when you lose a language, you lose a whole worldview, this ontological perspective, this whole way of engaging with the world. Um, the reason why I talk, I mention that particularly is that in Ericoon, I was uh, privileged and honoured um, to be adopted by the Songman. And he, the Songman, um, Joe Nalamata, adopted me as his father. Um, he was my father. He was the principal knowledge custodian of the community. And it was a distinct honour to be adopted by him, but also pragmatic because it meant there'd be no is any issues about telling me about the plants, potentially sacred knowledge, which was usually kept um, within clan or family groups or, or secret knowledge. And he was from the eucalyptus forest or timber country. And the last person in Ericoon to have been brought up traditionally as a hunter gatherer in the bush. And he only came into Arakoon, which was then a mission in the 1950s, as a 15 year old boy. And his parents exchanged him for bags of flour, tea, sugar, and tobacco, um, which seems a bit shocking that he was sold essentially for these commodities. But it was also his family were trying to protect him because, as Zena touched upon, about these acts of genocide, about these, that it was 
you know, people would go hunting for fun, go hunting Aboriginal people in Australia, that it was seen as a sport. And they're really shocking stories, um, you know, in quite recent history. And a lot of that gets brushed under the carpet. I mean, we've heard about in North America, it's emerging about these indigenous schools in Canada and um, the US where um, First Nations people, children, were forcibly taken from their families and put in these horrific institutions. And the same happened in Australia. And we talk about the stolen generation um, there, the government there did acknowledge that you know, in recent years and you know, it said, sorry, um, but so many lives were ruined and so many of the social issues, there's intergenerational trauma as well that has to be healed that, is you know very difficult. Um, um, well, a very difficult issue. Um, one of the most poignant um, moments in my field work um, was when I was working with some Tiwi ladies. The Tiwi people live in these islands off the north coast of Darwin in the Northern Territory. Melville Island um, was where I was working with these particular ladies, and we were sat on the beach one day, and they were looking out to see towards Darwin and they had tears streaming down their faces and they said this was where the boats came in with the white, white fella authorities came and took their children away and they took their children depending on their colour of their skin so if they were slightly paler skin they were deemed to have white blood therefore they had to be brought up in these um, institutions and so many of these children suffered horrendous abuse, um, like in North America. And these women that I can't imagine the pain and heartache um, as a mother now myself. I mean, I, I just couldn't imagine if somebody came and stole my children. And they said that they would get charcoal and rub the charcoal in the, the arms, the skin of their children to make them look darker so that the authorities wouldn't take their children. And these women never saw their children again. And that's really heartbreaking. So there has been this, so no wonder there's been a loss of knowledge. You know, people have been forcibly removed from their land and it's continuing today. There, you know, that there, there are conservation, um, fortress conservation projects funded by major conservation organizations that think to protect the environment, they need to forcibly evict the indigenous peoples. So when we consider that 80% of the world's biodiversity is stewarded by, the, by indigenous peoples who represent 5% of the world's population, human population. Um, we, you know, we really shouldn't be forcibly evicting indigenous peoples from their land. Um, anyway, I've been um, talking on loads of different <laughs> going on, but um, <laughs> did you I want to say anything, Aaron? <laughs> no, no, ask no. any questions? And, I mean, really, actually, Sarah, in one, one thing when we were working in Australia in 27, 2018, and um, we were given a book, Dark, Dark Emu, by um, Bruce Pascoe, and it was an extraordinary insight into, into First Nation, really evolved farming and how the settlers that arrived and, you know, conveniently said these people move around, they, they, they're, they're kind of walking about and actually it just allowed them to steal land and bring over the sheep and then the sheep were just following the sweetest grasses but what's interesting at the moment and we're in conversation next week with um a plant uh, scientist they're actually last year launched a whole native grass breeding program through uh Narrabri, which is um part of the, the environmental science department to the University of Sydney and um, there's some really interesting um, if anybody's interested to go and check it out but there's some fantastic um, accounts and a really moving piece of women talking about making the bread from these native grasses and how actually it was curing so many sicknesses that their people were suffering from you know because of the Europe because of the European way of dealing with grain and the sugars and the salts and the additives that go into bread but actually they were saying this is not just about nourishment for the body this is about this is about the soul they said this is the bread bringing the soul back to our people it's so moving and the women are you know kind of in tears as they speak so I'm just mm. going to 
we're going to come back with questions and answers, but I'm just going to hand over to Dan now to introduce and bring Raphael into the conversation as well. Yeah, just linking back to that, I mean, what was amazing with a lot of the First Nation people, the crops didn't need to be planted. They were there in the soil. And when the rains come, when the time is right, they come up. You didn't need to plant them. You didn't need fertilizers. It was working with nature. And that's so much uh, that we've lost, I think, over the years and, and seem to still be losing. But uh, Raphael, ni nice that you're, you're with us. Um, and fantastic that you got in touch with us. Uh, the link comes through uh, seeing a work that we have outside the Tate Modern at the moment, Voices Acorns that are oak trees. Uh, Raphael drew, uh, grew uh, acorns from under the tree that Queen Elizabeth thought she, well, when she heard that she wasn't gonna be beheaded but would become the Queen of England. Uh, whole nother cultural shift perhaps. But what really got us to was his links with chlorophyll and without chlorophyll, we wouldn't have life on this planet. And he even grew a, a grass jacket, I think for his wedding that I would like to hear more about, but perhaps not here <laughs> at some point, but that sounds really interesting. But also the, the fact, I mean, we think chlorophyll has been green, but there are red and pink varieties it's actually working its way into other life forms in salamander eggs or in sea slugs and things. It's fundamental to life on this planet. So Raphael, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Yeah, thank you very much appreciated. Zina, Sarah, Heather, it's been fantastic. I am super impressed. Um, it's, I feel like I've come home actually. I'll tell you my personal story very quickly. Grew up very humble circumstances in a super bohemian family. Um, everybody in my family was in film or theater or performing arts in some way. And um, I wanted to get out. Uh, I wanted to do something different. And I uh, felt I was missing something. So I grew molds under my bed in the pots and all decaying food, which makes actually very, very beautiful molds. And uh, had trouble in school. My brother was the academic superstar. Uh, I didn't fit. And I ended up having a, an opportunity to, uh, um, after seeing some movies actually about photosynthesis, um, which is in my book, uh, where James Stewart woos a lady by talking about photosynthesis. And I thought, I need to do this. So I went to a teacher in school and said, you know, what do I do? How do I do this? And we built a greenhouse and we germinated some seeds. And in every seed, in every plant, in everything you eat, there is four billion years of wisdom built in. It knows what to do. It knows how to take care of the environment. And I was off. That was it for me. I knew what to do. I knew how I was going to grow things and I was going to study them. And it was the time when sort of molecular biology and gene engineering became the hot thing. And I became one of those real hardcore empirical gene benders. And I loved it. I lived in the laser lab. I made the first ever photosystem too. That's that molecule that holds those chlorophylls that do that water splitting and that make that miracle of physical light energy to chemical energy conversion. And I tried to figure out how that bit works. And it was one of those things where in the real world, academic departments argue with each other. And our department had some really great grants, but my professor did not have tenure. And there was a hostile takeover by the chemistry department. And I was out of a, I was out of a lab. And so I needed to find a new place. And I went to uh, the West Coast of the US. And uh, the first thing they said is, you don't know anything about photosynthesis. It's time you went to the real world and see how it happens out there in nature. And I'm a Munich born mountain boy and going to the middle of the Pacific was not my idea of fun. And even on that very first cruise, I knew that I, had missed really a fundamental trick. In the ocean where we all come from, 
the photosynthetic sort of turnover and efficiency is much higher than it is on land. It's a much more productive environment. And uh, this then took me to watch the ozone hole come under the ice and Antarctica, looking for uh, organisms all over the planet. But another life change came. I had a family. I became a management consultant. And all my mates uh, sort of said, oh, it's so expensive and difficult to grow algae in, for biofuels. And I thought the first thing that was sort of very odd about this was why would you burn algae? It's completely nuts. It's like, you know, the healthiest, nicest possible food. And here we're using it as a fuel source. There's just, it just was sort of misallocation of, of, of purpose. But the second thing was it seemed completely crazy. Why is this expensive? In the real world, everything that our planet does comes from algae having transformed the atmosphere having transformed the oceans. When the planet formed, it was a toxic brown iron riddled mess. It was, uh, you know, hostile uh, to life like us today. And, uh, and algae transformed it and they, it literally can move mountains. And so I, I, I thought, well, in the real world, the biggest thing we can do about climate change is to um, is to actually take advantage of that power and help the algae do exactly the thing that they do best. And there's a lot of free land, there's a lot of sunlight, there's a lot of wind, that's where the sun sea wind comes from. And I mean, Sarah said it, instead of working with things out of Northern European labs or you know, Japanese labs that have been on a shelf in a lab growing in very dingy light for 150 years, if you just work with the local organisms, it, you can grow algae in the desert. And so I set out to do that. And it's been a long journey, but from the very get-go, from the very beginning, what we did is, is we basically take those natural algal blooms that happen in, just as you described, after the rains, uh, that happen after the winter or spring uh, sort of storms, when the water mixes and deep nutrient-rich water comes to the surface and the right, light is right. We just figured out how to copy that model of, of that spring bloom where you have a very, very rich productive environment and recreate that at very low cost year round to do a couple things. One is it produces fantastic food. It has all the healthy proteins. It has the wonderful sort of pigments. And as Dan said, there are many other pigments besides chlorophyll. It has the sort of omega-3s and the healthy things. The other thing it does, it takes CO2 out of the environment and we can actually trap the CO2. We can bury the residual that we don't want to sell or that has lower value, make this truly carbon neutral. And so my, this, I can talk lots about uh, Zena, your stories and Sarah, uh, between my mother and my family and our experience, there are many, 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 many parallels. But my hope was to try to do something that would be scalable and that can be large and that can actually have an impact. There are many lovely uh, cosmetics products or hand washes that have algae in them, but I wanted to do something where people can actually eat the material and enjoy it, feel a connection, uh, that includes our local staff. We work with a lot of uh, illiterate people who grew up in the middle of the desert, frankly. 50% uh, of our staff is female um, because as you have described, there is this connection. And it, it works from a, from a biological perspective, but it also works in terms of the needs of modern societies in terms of food that is sustainable. And to me, it's been difficult to communicate that, which is why I'm very happy to be here to find people who actually think about this and find another way of telling that story. Um, 
But there is one thing which is why I wrote the book that I felt was missing. And the book is all about things that we can do um, in everyday normal conventional, oh, thank you, Heather, in everyday normal conventional life. Um, for example, here is that Queen Elizabeth acorn, one of, I've done, now done many, which is from a thousand year old tree and 500 years ago it was producing acorns. And now a thousand years later, it's a direct connection to history, right? If you see, I don't know if you can see in my background here, you see a bunch of lavender. Sorry, my arc here is not very good. The lavender is feeding the Bermondsey uh, honey, the Bermondsey bees here in the dead center of London. Um, I've got avocados and a whole bunch of plants growing. We all can do something and it does exactly what you said. It reconnects us. And if you look, listen to people like uh, Suzanne Simard in, in, in uh, Aus, um, Canada, who's looking at the wood wide web uh, and the way trees communicate. Um, you know, there are so many new ways that people are recognizing that we interact with nature or nature interacts with us that it's really no, it's from my point of view, it's really no surprise. If I were a tree, I would want to mollify those crazy mammals that run around as well. <laughs> so whatever it is the trees are doing. Um, just the last point on the, on the, in 89, my first marriage, I did grow my own jacket. <laughs> it looked like a fur coat. It was fantastic. It was just this radiant green, wonderful thing. It also was incredibly waterlogged and I made a huge mess, but the fact is, is it was a really, really great experience. So when I saw you guys and I saw the photos with the grass and uh, the boys piece, I, when, when we started a very humble life as a kid, one of the things that was a real treasure for me was I had a postcard from Joseph Boyce. And it was a little postcard that basically sort of thanked my mother for uh, a documentary she had worked on. And, uh, and, um, and I found him really hilarious as a kid. The fat chair, to me, you know, what would represent wealthy donors better to artists, to me at least that worked. The honey pump, I thought was fantastic. And then of course he did the 7,000 trees. And so I had to reach out when I saw your acorns. It was absolutely, it just was a happy moment. Oh. And, uh, and so, yeah, so thank you for this. Uh, really love all of this. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm wondering how to help communicate the ecocide story. Um, because, because I agree and I experience it. Uh, uh, we, we are just beginning to get involved in regrowth of mangroves, mm -hmm. for example, in our communities where, where we want to grow the algae. Uh, because I agree that the sort of a displacement of people and land both um, for marginal benefits uh, is something we can do something about and we can fix. And so I'd love to do more of this. I really, really enjoy um, in your book, the, the section on the mangrove because they're phenomenal. They're absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, just reading it, I just want to know more about mangrove and understand, yeah, again, how to be more actively engaged in some way to promote how extraordinary the mangrove um, coastal forests are. I mean, I think what is fantastic about this book, Raphael, is just, it, it is kind of inspiringly, we can, we, can, we can shift, we can do this, and whether or not it is from the very small micro gardens within the cities or within the gardens, um, you know, I almost just think that councils should make a dictate that nobody can actually dig up their front lawn anymore and <laughs> down to park a car. I just think, no, you know, and I nearly, I nearly had words with a neighbour who'd cut down this bush for the last 30 years has been one of the favorite homes of the sparrows and he just cut it right back. And you, you know, those moments still kind of really kind of sit quite hard, but I- they're, they're, they're like little mini, mini ecocides, but they're happening all around us all the time. So if you see them happening, speak out. 
I think it, it's quite interesting from read, reading some of it, the, the, the idea that plants et the soil was a way that we, we, uh, yeah, we thought about nature and how it consumed things, but actually it's light. And I, I think we need another age of enlightenment now. So hopefully that's something we're working towards without the light, without chlorophyll, we, yeah. That's what, that's, uh, that should be our economy, the chlorophyll. Well, it just, it's a photosynthesis really, because it's, um, you know, just the whole evolution from what I understand about reading Raphael is how much photosynthetic bacteria they are, you know, the symbiosis, all of this stuff is, re is a real revelation actually. I learned so much about the history of photons, photosynthesis, but I also learned how little I really understood about it. So, I mean, it was fantastic from that point of view. We have a few minutes to go before we have some Q&A with um, people who are listening. I'd just like to draw breath, put a little momentary pause in, and I'd love to invite Zina, who has um, to share a poem um, with us. So, Zina, when I'll pass over to you. Hey, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, again, uh, um, just from the perspective of how uh, my writing is also very much a, a, an action for me. It's a physical act, like the pen and the uh, paper, that co connection between pen and paper is wood on wood, pencil and paper, wood on wood, if you like. Um, it's a very much a connection for me. So uh, that's going to weave through this poem a little bit. Food. Life is a cabbage. It is a simple food. The external leaves weather the harshest conditions. They are closest to the earth and they are prone to attack from the insidious appetite of slimy belly crawlers. They are exposed to the searing heat and withering frosts. The fibrous spine and sinews of the darker hued leaves, rich with the chlorophyll exhaling oxygen, is the part of the cabbage that gets torn off and thrown away even though they hold the most nutrients. So when a season passes and the autumn prayers welcome decay, those dead leaves drop and nourish the maturing heart. Trees, adaptability, resilience, two words that are perhaps the most important in my archive. For the last decade, words like these have proven themselves robust yet fluid enough to flow with cataclysmic shifts in the collective conscience when the demise of the pen to paper crossfades with rapid thumb movements, dreaming awake, technology crowds words with binaries. Retired words knock from the inside of hardback dictionaries, replaced by Google Brain. But who am I to say that that meaning starves in text speak? that emoticons cram emotions. Some of us just really do miss out on the touch of wood, the smell of reams of paper, and do not mind the weight or the scrawl of the hand. We read in the languages of swipes, interest paid in tokens and credits, quick thinking minds of the short attention spans, judgment about what should be, it, what, judgment about what should be is futile. What is, is interesting, and there's nothing else to it, other than to learn a new language of a digital age and focus on who are planting the new trees. I often speak of trees and ponder, when us literary humans become the canon, how sturdy are the branches that next generations will use to climb? Will the fruit they dream be too heavy with questions about the legacy left for them? Will it be enough? Will the branches be hollow or dense and oily with nutrients we promised them with our mouths? We are trees. They are our ancestors, imbibing the tune of light, their exhalation the food of our lungs. We forget their breath is laced through the branches, leaves as paper lanterns, strung as pathways through the boughs to guide the climb to the highest fruit, closest to the sun, protect them from thieves and appropriators, 
trading on the superhighways of tangled roads to success and relevance. Relevance is how we consistently throw questions at our hearts. How prepared are we to look into the abyss of our subconscious with a potential light at the end of life's labyrinthine tunnels? Thank you so much, Zina. Thank you so much. That was really, really beautiful. Thank you. Lovely. And so, I mean, it just, yeah, just the conversation we've had about language, mm. about trees, everything. It was just a beautiful, beautiful evocation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, Dawn, do we have some questions? Q&A? Oh, sorry, get my video to work properly. <laughs> yes, um, we have a couple of questions. So I'll read you the first one, um, which has come through, which is there's an enormous divide between people who are connecting with the eco crisis and those people and corporations who hold most of the power to make the necessary changes. So how can this vast gulf be bridged? And I guess maybe that's a link to some of the activism that you've been talking about as well. Um, I don't yeah. know, Heather, do you want to start? Um, I mean, I would direct people towards the Stop Ecocide campaign. It's fantastic. Um, Jojo Meta at the moment and working with an extraordinary um, team of collaborators all across the globe to really try and bring this into place. Um, I mean, obviously, legally, it's going to be moving relatively, relatively slowly. And we know how rapidly accelerating just with this heat dome and heat waves that is happening. But I'd like to pass this over to, to Sarah and Zina and Raphael to answer as well. So if anybody would like to answer, hand up and please, or just talk about this. Sarah? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I would say that the way we are and our being, we can actually, make a difference ourselves on an individual level and the more individuals there are making a positive difference globally can be a really powerful movement um i mean sometimes i feel very disempowered myself and you see what's going on i mean i live not far from where the hs2 line's going th going through and i've seen these beautiful ancient woods being chopped down with um you know, nesting birds, you know, totally illegal, I'd imagine. Um, totally. And my heart breaks and I feel really powerless. I feel bereavement at it. You know, it's really um, emotionally heartrending. But we could just say, oh, it's all too big. The people in power have so much power that the people who are perpetrating all these ecological um, destructive acts, what can we do? But collectively we can all do a lot if we as an individual make positive choices by being maybe mindful being less materialistic um, I've, I've got a little um something really profound i went to a meeting last february at oxford university just before the lockdown when there were some indigenous leaders from amazonia so chief rioni of the Keopi people and um the amazonian leader debbie from the yanomami and Chief Rioni said, the trouble is you people, or you, i.e. Westerners or uh, the rest of the world, you are slaves. You are all slaves to money because you cannot live in your society without money. But us, we have the forest, which I thought was really profound. And there, the translation in their language um, for money is bad leaf. So I think... What we're up against is actually quite a big, you know, it's a major, major issue. It's about the way our whole society is structured around cons con being consumers and being materialistic and this idea of economic growth and, you know, the fact that we have to buy new commodities all the time. So I think um, it's a really difficult question to address, but I think power we are powerfully, as individuals joining together, each making individual positive differences on a global level can actually be really positive and do some way to address the damage that's being done. Sarah. Raphael, do you have Yeah, some very thoughts? quickly. I mean, uh, I, the, the, the thing I love about the ecocide story and trying to connect it to people in power 
is that it is true that the human narrative, starting with Gilgamesh, we have cut down as humans in the last couple thousand years, four and a half trillion trees. There weren't so many of us, but all we seem to do is cut trees. That's human activity in the last 5,000 years. Um, however, so it's deeply baked into who we are as societies, as economies, as cultures. But part of the story in the book is that these photosynthesis researchers and explorers and discoverers, naturalists who came from the most diverse backgrounds and were some of the quirkiest people out there, um, managed to continue to create a new story and rewrite the way we see the world through the most cataclysmic human tragedies, through wars, through famines, through strange, weird political systems, uh, religious battles, and yet they persisted and found a way forward and through this. And I think we can do that again and again. And I completely agree with Sarah. There is now nearly eight, there are eight billion of us humans. We as a collective have incredible power and ingenuity and um, curiosity and also sort of a hunger for meaning and, 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 and making a positive contribution. Nobody wants to be the ecocidal exploiter. We become that, but the fact is, is we can do something about that. And so I do think this forum and these kinds of discussions are really important to help inform the people who are in power. Now I raise, I have to raise money for our farms to try to build these farms. And there is a lot of um, money about, uh, but it is very difficult to try to ask people to do something new and different that's unfamiliar. And in that sense, being able to tell the story in a different way, make it visually or emotionally or physically, Zena talking about the body, accessible to people. So one of the ways that we uh, try to impress uh, our potential investors is that we make vegan caviar. Now, nobody in the world really needs vegan caviar. It happens to be really nice, but the point is there's not a market. You can't build a business on that. But, but the fact is, is it helps to communicate the story. And so I think it's on us to try to come up with a way to get people to recognize the challenges and the issues. And, and in that sense, I think there is a really, uh, there's a lot of you know, opportunity as well. And, and, and I think people are managing to get the message through. By the way, Dan, one of the things is Extinction Rebellion is the nicest protest to go to. It's delightful. People are lovely. They bring their children on school breaks. I mean, it is a really lovely community. So I think that aspect of it, that kind of civil inclusiveness also makes, a, you know, ultimately gets through to those in power. Anyway. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's one thing I, I wanted to say is actually joining groups like Culture Declares, like Writers Rebel, like Extinction Rebellion. It's, it's non-violent, it's a pacifist movement, and it's the only thing that actually has given me a sense of possibility that we can change the fucked up world we're in, and I'm sorry, but that's where we are, and we need such changes. But it's a balance throughout so many different cultures too, that we need to keep it integrated. And yeah, I, I would say to anyone, join, get involved, do something. It, it gives you a sense of empowerment and that's what we need right now. Um, and yeah, Zena, sorry. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, I was gonna say, I think we also need to recognize that the eco crisis is also a social justice struggle as well. Um, you know, you have organizations uh, like the Wretched of the Earth um, who are constantly also trying to, you know, fight to have um, um, their voice heard on the front lines of, of some of the 
like, like Extinction Rebellion, for example, uh, where Extinction Rebellion will be transplanted or superimposed over an organisation like Wretched of the Earth. But we, so we have to start looking at how these marginalised groups, people from black and brown communities, indigenous communities, need to be pushed to the forefront. You have to have their voices at the forefront because they are the ones that are have been struggling the most with this. They have been in crisis since colonialism hit their lands. So we have to push that to the forefront also um, and look at the intersection between race and class also. So it is a struggle there. And I think it means that people have to not be frightened to engage with that. You, you cannot change the world without changing yourself in some ways. You cannot change a narrative without changing yourself in some ways. So you have to look at, sometimes you have to take a, a deeper look at your conscious, your own unconscious biases about um, narratives around race and narratives around class. And you have to address that. That can be done by using art and culture and, and education as well. Um, I think there's almost like um, how, we have to think about how, um, the custodians um, of these of these indigenous groups, the indigenous groups are the custodians of the land. Um, you almost have to, and I'm not calling saying call to arms or anything like that, but you know, you have people who, for example, the conservation of the, the, the black rhino, you know, you have people going around who on a, it's a military operation. You have men who just, you know, they, they leave their families, they pick up arms to protect these animals against poachers. You know, it, it has to become a military operation in some ways also, um, which can be a military operation of pumping out a new narrative. You know, like we are going to address this narrative through, you know, through the, the, the books like Raphael has written, um, through the creation of art, the creation of culture. You know, that in its own right has to be a military operation because that is how colonialism rolls itself out. It attacks on all these different fronts. And we have to be, pre be prepared to be resilient and persistent to um, push back against that narrative, to have a, cult a counter narrative. So um, for me, as, a, as, a, as an artist um, and who's a consumer of culture and who constantly goes into education spaces, um, you know, uh, I, as a... As a, as a um, as somebody who wants to learn more, but also as a practitioner, um, it's about how we change the narrative also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just, just wanted to say something about, that, um, about the poachers. One of the drivers for poaching is poverty, it's inequality. And again, that is based on, you know, it's a legacy of colonialism. Across the world, you see this disparity in wealth and power, or power and wealth sort of go hand in hand. And it's, to do with yeah uh, legacy colonialism and inequalities and that is the driver for the uh, uh, again for you know when somebody's living hand to mouth and you know they want to put food in their children's bellies then you know saving another species isn't going to be paramount in their mind so that's you know there is a social justice issue that needs to be addressed as well I mean it's really important yeah, and through the pandemic, there was a lot of discussion around the universal universal basic income, and I think Spain have actually rolled that out. But you sort of think, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I know this was um, um, Oxfam did um, a calculation, and I think it was twenty thirteen, and it so shocked me. I actually pinned it up on the wall, and at that point, it was sixty four of the world's wealthiest billionaires owned the equivalent wealth of 50% of the world's poorest people. And actually what's happened over the last seven or eight years, it shrunk. So we actually have even smaller amount of phenomenally wealthy people. Um, but the pandemic has thrown so many um, people into such crisis and again revealed such social injustice, uh, social and racial, injust racial injustice. And you kind of think, can't the economy, can't they just cut everything? Just give people a living wage, put food on the table. You know, it, is it really that, I mean, is it really that impossible? Can we really not get the money out of these super, super, super wealthy people and actually make sure nobody has to go and poach, that they actually can put food on the table? Because we've done extraordinary stuff about feeding people as, you know, Raphael was also talking in Light to Life. It's quite extraordinary how you know, how that is being counted. It's never going to be 100% successful, but a lot is being done. I know, anyway, I, I, is there another question, Dawn, or should we start to wrap up? So, well, so this is kind of our decision. There's been a couple of other questions that have come through, but it is the 
it is 8 30 so we are due to finish so maybe if I just tell like maybe this can just be some part of the food for, food for thought at the end so I'll just mention some of the things that people have discussed which we have a, um, a question just about again like what things can we do locally which I think links in very well to what you've been discussing um, lots of people Zina saying that they loved your poem um, which I did too so thank you very much um, some questions around um, how can we demonstrate that everyone can find these connections even in the most urban concrete of spaces um, also just who are planting the new trees for the next generations to climb just as a really good piece of food for thought um, and then um, Oh, there's even more questions coming in as I'm as I'm asking them to you. And then another question, just mentioning um, the uh, the grown work and just talking about um, how to like it's very manicured sometimes that your grown pieces. So is there a way of like actually showing biodiversity within the grass works? And actually, the piece that didn't work properly was actually really really interesting because yeah, I guess. For, for that reason as well. Yeah. I mean, we we kind of, we have a point list, you know, or, um, you know, we actually do like the real formality because we're exploring the chlorophyll uh, to some extent and the sensitivity of that of that pigment. I mean, we have considered really introducing a lot of people have asked, bring in wildflowers. But I think there is, I mean, we're a huge critic, huge critic, we're huge critics as well of lawn and, you know, um, uh, but, you know, yeah, we hear you. We hear you. It was very... I, I, I think, as you saw, Dawn, when the piece started to decline, you, you actually embrace it. We, we did change it over because it was getting to a point. But that's nature. And, you know, the, it is that balance. When, when it's right, it's perfect. When it's not, things go pear-shaped. And so it's, it's all important. Uh, and I, I, yeah, we're not scared of showing that, I think, at times. But it maybe gets difficult within the gallery situation. The whole, in, we would, did a whole battle back in 1991. There were a lot of with corruption as well. So we do recreate the corruption along with, to be honest, grass just grows. It's like a it's like a pencil. It's like pencils of nature to quote. We're really concerned around the chlorophyll and its extraordinary photographic abilities. Um, so the formality of it works very really well for us. No, no, thank you. And I was going to say, I think probably there were some really lovely questions in there that would have been really lovely to have asked Zina um, about um, her poem. But I think that maybe um, it is 8.30, so maybe we should start to wrap it up. I don't know if there's anything else you would like to say. Um, anybody? I would really, really thank so much Zina and Sarah and Raphael for being with us and present and so and insightful. And, you know, I just, I look forward to further conversation, you know, and to the, ne the next time as well. Um, yeah, so just really warm thanks. And to Andy for inviting us to be part of the program and to Dawn as well that she's done. We also had a great work as well with Lottie Child on Sunday. That was fantastic. Play tablets and doing sort of, so really warm thanks and to Dawn. <laughs> everybody who's been part of the evening we really appreciate you taking the time and spending spending time with us yes no um just to echo that as well yes thank you so much to everybody for joining us it's i like there's loads and loads of comments that we'll share with you all afterwards but they're really really lovely i think everybody's really enjoyed kind of listening to you all talk and for your thoughts and everything it has been really it's just been really really interesting so thank you so much everybody um I'm going to bring this to a close then, but just to quickly say to everybody, um, uh, Heather and Dan's work is still on display, so please do come down to the gallery um, to come and look at their work. Um, it's wonderful, so please do. Um, and um, Heather is and Dan are still in residence at the moment as well, so they are on site doing some bits and pieces um, from time to time, so you know you might bump into them at some point as well if you pop down um, and just to say um, that we will be having some other in conversation events for some of our other artists in residence later on during the year so please do keep an eye out for them um, I can't give you a date yet unfortunately for the next one but they will be coming very very soon um, yeah no, a massive thank you to everybody um, yeah thank you so much thank you. so take care everybody Everyone. Thank you. Much appreciated.